said we would said we would finish up uh, Ptolemy's Gate <clears throat> and Uh, pick up around, if you have it with you, about 488 or so. <clears throat> Nathaniel and Bartimaeus have a plan. Uh, let me back up. Just 486. Okay. <clears throat> I think we discussed this, but I just want to make sure. 486. <clears throat> right in the exact middle of the page. Nathaniel's talking to Kitty, and he tells her, you know, we tried the, the staff with um, at maximum power. Full controllable power, he says. I tried it at maximum controllable power, but it wasn't enough now to absorb the energy. She says, well then, we get you out, then we think again. That is, let get out of this situation, and then we'll... So... Nathaniel asks Bartimaeus. You know, notice, Nathaniel doesn't have to ask Bartimaeus this. He can just think it. What will happen if we leave Nada now? Um, in time, Nada will become bored with the manifold delights of the One World Exhibition. He will turn his attention to the rest of London. He will feed on its people and so swell in size and power. This growth will further stimulate his hunger until either the city lies buried or he bursts. Is that honest enough? He says, uh, I've got to stop this. Nathaniel says that to Kitty. I've got to stop this. But you can't. You just said so. Even at full power. He said, mm, no, maximum controllable power. There's one way of getting more energy from it, and that's by removing Gladstone's safeguards, the spell that binds his down. All, notice, no way, let me finish, implies what? She kind of, and he's like, hmm? it's it's almost like a stage direction, okay? The spells that bind the staff, all its power, would be unleashed in one fell swoop. Notice, he smiled at her. I think that might give him out a pause. Meaning, that might take care of him. I don't buy it. Who's to say it won't just make him even stronger? Bartimaeus, can't you? Nathaniel goes on. There's one other faculty, uh, one other factor to be taken into the equation. And he points towards the roof. What's this building made of? Glass and, notice, it can't be all glass. The glass has got to be attached to something. Ah, Bartimaeus' voice cuts in. Notice, that's telling us Bartimaeus doesn't have full access to what Nathaniel is thinking. Okay? <clears throat> ah, you know, reluctant as I am to say it, he might actually have a point there. Why do you think he's reluctant to say it? He's here. One, because he didn't think of it first. Two, what does he know it means? Or, what might he think it means? Uh, basically, that he's not getting out of this. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, what can they not do? I mean, if he destroys that and it comes crashing down... Um, Kind of hard to, it's not like they're wizards in the Hogwarts world and they can apparate somewhere else, you know. Iron, the thing you said, iron. And now that being a spirit is not protected against them. If the staff is broken and it all comes crashing down on them, what do you think, Bartimaeus? It might work. 
But there's one small flaw. And notice he doesn't state it. Kitty, however, reads it. Exactly. How do you break the staff without being harmed? I don't think that's the flaw Bartimaeus is thinking of. I think Bartimaeus is thinking of the flaw. Um, we're we're going to die here. That, that's a bigger flaw, you know. How do you break the staff without being harmed? And what about the roof flaw? Ah, now she gets it. Nathaniel stretched. His neck felt cold and stiff. Leave that to me. We'll be all right. Why does his neck feel cold and stiff? Just sheer speculation. He's dying. Okay? You know, he's got that gaping hole in his side. He's dying. He knows he's dying. Okay? Okay, fine. I'll do this with you. What can she do, though? Nothing. There, there's nothing she can do to help them. No, you won't. Bartimaeus' protective shields won't extend to you as well. Will they, Bartimaeus? Notice that will is italicized. Why? It's a clue. He knows. He's trying to tell Bartimaeus, okay, right? Wink, wink. Uh, no, we'll be all right. His mind drifts a little. He feels Bartimaeus prompting him. Look, I've got seven league boots on. That, that is, it's, you know, Bartimaeus gives him a little jab in the brain to say, don't worry about the boots. We can get out faster. We'll catch you up. Just get out now and keep on running. Nathaniel, better go, kitty. Now that we'll leave the palace soon and the chance will be gone. She stamps her foot. Her defiance warmed him. What does that mean, it warmed him? You know, it's like a little shot of adrenaline. It gives him a little bit of life back. He grinned at her. Listen, I'm the magician. You're the commoner. I'm the one who ordered you about. Remember, he's being totally facetious and sarcastic, obviously. Right? She scowls. Sure you'll be able to use the boots? No problem. So I'll see you both outside. Promise? What's going on? What are they saying but not saying to each other? Oh, I see you again. Keep going. What's being implied? Yeah, keep going. They care about each other. I mean, they really care. This is this is budding love. If you want to put it that way. All right? Yes, now go. She turns. She says, the amulet, take the amulet. It'll keep you safe. Nathaniel, no, that won't be any good for me. Why? Because the amulet won't stop him from dying. It, it doesn't work from the inside out. All right? But he does think you don't get far enough away, it will protect her from the blast. Tiny glint of light shone in the corners of her eyes. Why not? What are those glints of light? Tears. See, she's starting to get what he's talking about. Bartimaeus, because of so powerful a charm, it might absorb too much of the staff's energy and enable Nada to escape. Best thing you could do is take it and wear it and go now. His voice echoed silently in Nathaniel's head. How's that? How's that for what? What did Bartimaeus just do? Give her a reason that she can accept. Give her, give her a reason that she can accept, but it's a bald-faced lie. And he knows it is. He looked at Kitty. She had halted with the amulet, outstretched. Her eyes searched Nathaniel's face. He saw her aura shining all about them, picking out everything in clear, unblemished detail. The tree bark, veins on the leaves, the stones, grass about their feet. He felt himself bathed within it. Okay? What? This is, 
you know, he is participating in her glory, her, her glory of existence that he's now seeing. And why is he seeing it? Because of Bartimaeus inside him. Oh, yeah, I'm still not coming. <clears throat> and his weariness departs. It seemed to me as he really is that gives him the energy to do what he needs to do. See you later, Kitty. See you. You too, Bartimaeus. Notice what Bartimaeus doesn't say. He doesn't say, see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye is all, well, theoretically at least. It's always what? It's final. What's it come from? Good by comes from the phrase, God be with thee. That's what it literally comes from. It's a shortened version of that, right? In from phrase from the Middle Ages, why would you say God be with you? God be with you. You're going off to die. You're going off somewhere. Go away. You're going off somewhere. Okay? And it's kind of saying, I'm going my way, you're going your way, wherever you go, may God go with you. May God, you know, bless your steps, etc., etc. It's a blessing. But it's a final blessing. It's not what you say, you know, as you step out the door to talk to somebody else for five minutes and then you're going to come back. Because it's kind of like, well, there's nothing really that's going to happen to you then. Then she was gone among the trees. What do you think, Bartimaeus? Can you go for it? Might as well. I've got nothing better to do. Now, what does that statement by Bartimaeus imply? What? You know, just roll the dice. Just so Kitty's almost at the entrance. She hears the sound of her voice, of a voice. She keeps running. Okay. <clears throat> Page 490. She gets a bit away. At the same moment, she was conscious of a noise, of a dull bulb of sound that seemed almost to swallow itself, flaring and subsiding on the instant. The grass she stood on rose and fell in a little tremor that passed away into the dark. Kitty turned toward the glass palace, sinking to her knees. She was just in time to see its orange glow eaten from within by a dazzling swell of whiteness which rose up and outward through the margins of the dome, shattering each and every pane of glass, to the, so that the short shards exploded into the night. The whiteness hid the palace. It streamed on across the ornamented gar ornamental gardens, ate away the remaining distance, and engulfed Kitty, knocking her backward with its force. The amulet of Samarkand fell hard against her face. Dimly, she saw it glow glowing, drawing in the raging energy. All about her was a fearful rushing. All about her, grass burned. But notice, she doesn't. Because the amulet is, you know, acting as a shield for her. Then, silence. What, the description of the explosion is almost like what kind of explosion? Nuclear bombs. Yeah. It's, you know, it goes up and then out. It's the mushroom, okay? She opens her eyes. She sees it's dark. And she looks towards where the palace was. Outlined against it was a complex mass of metal, twisting, bending, fragile as a net of wire. As she watched, it <coughs> implodes, growing dense and darkly packed. Okay? Within minutes, the earth was glittering like frost. Why? It's the shards of glass. Trying to scatter everywhere. Okay? Chapter 37 goes to two days later. So notice we're not told what happens from then until two days, five hours after the explosion. But what we are told happens is we have a new government set up. Okay? Piper is in charge of this council. Who was Piper? Anybody remember? 
Nathaniel's assistant, his you know executive secretary or administrative assistant kind of thing. She's she's not running the government, but she's pretty important. Who do they get to be the new secretary, kind of like the new um, prime minister, Mr. Buckles? Okay, what happened to Jane Farrar? Well, earlier, back when, you know, Nathaniel goes off after the staff, uh, I don't remember which chapter, um, Kitty goes into that room of captured ministers and junior ministers and such, and Jane Farrar is there, and she's saying, this is what we need to do, we need to go out of here so that we can help protect the commoners, and Jane Farrar's like, screw the commoners, man. They can take care of themselves. You guys are a bunch of peons, you're nobodies. We need to get, and she says, I'm going to get my wolves, and we're going to, and she runs off into the darkness, never to be seen again, you know. She gets destroyed, apparently, okay? So, <coughs> page 493, Kitty had been offered the previous morning by Ms. Piper a seat among the council, that is, membership in the inner sanctum of the government, and she says, you don't want me here. Why? Because she knows what's going to be involved. It's going to be people sitting at the tables in a circle and doing what? If you want something not to be done, what do you do? You might not be old enough to realize this yet. You will be. Make a committee. Form a committee to do something. You, know, you get 5, 10, 15, 20, however people, members of the committee are, all having their own viewpoints, and seldom, you know, does something actually occur, okay? So, we, you know, we read about how the government, you know, plans starts to move forward and such. Then we get chapter 38. Dying was the symbol. Our main problem was catching cold. Now it is attention. <clears throat> so, what do they do? They get close enough to him, and Bartimaeus shouts to him, 497. Now it is I, Bartimaeus Sacre Algini, in Gorso the Mighty, in the Serpent of Silver Plume. I fought a thousand battles and won them all. I've destroyed far greater entities than you. Ramudra fled before my majesty. Chu, which is, you know, utter lies, right? I mean, Ramudra was like, you know, it was the amulet that took care of Ramudra. Um, he says, I challenge you, come face me. So, that's good. No answer. Nauda was busily munching on some of the exhibits in the Grotto of Taxidermy. So, Nathaniel, that's a goad? I mean, you, that was boasting. That, that was, you weren't goading him. Listen, a goad's anything that provokes or incites an enemy. And, oh look, it didn't work, did it? We're running out of time. A few more steps, and John and Nathaniel says, let me have a go. Cursed demon. Yeah, that's going to get them, because they don't like being called demons. You have met your end. The shivering fire awaits you. I shall spread your vile essence across this hall like um, like margarine. A very, oh yeah, that's really effective, pardon me, it says. Okay? Cursed demon, attend to me. Pity of it was that the boy's voice was desperately faint and growing fainter. He just doesn't have the human energy to do it. But he does fire the staff off at Nauta, hits him in the butt. Nauta turns around and sees them and says, Bartimaeus, I see you. And the boy whispered something in reply. Okay. But he's too weak to say it. So Bartimaeus says Nathaniel's words. Why? Not only physically why, but why? What's this indicating? Hmm. 
they're really joined now. They're kind of speaking in one mind. How, how many times has that happened in the past? Bartimaeus essentially says, once, the healing talk. No other no other magician and demon have done this. What did make peace think was going to happen when he called now to Abraham? He would control now to right? Or new to however you want to pronounce his name. I guess if you equate it with the cheese, Gouda, it would be Gouda. Okay? So, no, I am Nathaniel. I am your master. I am your death. That's what you call a proper goat, you know. <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't bad, right? You wait till he's on top of us, then we break the staff. The longer it takes, the better. Kitty, that is, what? Because notice it doesn't finish. Check it out, don't worry. They're both thinking, Kitty is not going to live. The boy's strength was failing, 499. But his resolution was undaunted. I felt him summon his remaining powers, steadily, calmly, muttering under his breath. He loosed the bonds restraining Gladstone's staff until all at once the hopes of the entities trapped inside were raised. Notice, Bartimaeus can sense this. They pushed, strained, pressed against remaining loops of magic, desperate to be free. Without my assistance, Nathaniel could not have controlled them. They would have instantly broken through. But Nuna was not yet where we wanted him. I held the staff in place. There was nothing now to do but wait. According to some, footnote, generally, those who don't have to do it. And, and, you know, this is one of the things I love about it. I love how he, you know, gives these little footnotes, in revealing, you know, a lot of the humor. Heroic deaths are admirable things. I've never been convinced by this argument, mainly because, no matter how cruel, stylish, composed, unflappable, manly, or defiant you are, at the end of the day, you're also dead. Right? which is a little too permanent for my liking. You know, if you're familiar with Shakespeare, he's much more a Falstaffian kind of demon or gin, you know. The better part of valor, discretion is the better part of valor. That is, no one to fight, no one to run away, you know. I've made a long and successful career out of running away at the decisive moment. That's how he's been able all those thousands of years to taunt Jabor and Fakwara. Because <coughs> both of them are stronger than he was. Because he always knew, press him so far, and then run. And it was with some considerable, re considerable regret, as new to bore down upon us in that soaring tomb of iron and glass, I realized I didn't actually have a fallback. He realizes, this is going to be a tight one. I'm not going to get out of here. I was bound to the boy, essence to flesh. We were going out together. Essence to flesh. He's kind of like saying, I was his soul. Even though, not literally, okay? I'm just saying that figuratively. The nearest I'd ever come to this dubious last stand business was with Ptolemy. And what did we see, beginning of this section, I think it was, with Ptolemy? Ptolemy's wounded, he's got his back up against the wall, you know, he's slumped down to the ground, and the enemy are getting ready to break in, and what does he do? He dismisses Bartimaeus at the last moment. And Bartimaeus is like, no. In fact, he'd only prevented it with his final intervention. I suppose if my old master could have seen me now, he'd probably have approved. Way to go, Bartimaeus. You did it again. Okay. You joined with another. It was right up the street. You know, human, Jenny, united, working together as one. Trouble was, we'd taken it up all a bit too lit. It wasn't supposed to go this far. Bartimaeus. Has Nathaniel ever said anything like that before? No. Foul demon, rotten demon, you know. What do you say to something? I mean, come on. 
wow, you've just been dandy too. I didn't say you were perfect. Far from it. Let's face it, you've managed to cough things up. The bloody cheek. Well, since we're doing straight talking, let me tell you, you know, if we're going to unbear- unburden our chest, you know, before we die, which is why I'm dismissing it. What? Don't take it the wrong way. It's just that we've got to break the staff at the right moment here. You're holding it in check. I can't rely on you for something as important as this. You're bad. You're bound to mess it up somehow. Hey, Nathaniel you're being honest? Or is this his way of protecting Bartimaeus? Best thing is, best thing is to dismiss you. That'll trigger the staff. Once Bartimaeus is gone, the staff just is gone. Because he's the only thing keeping those entities, because Nathaniel has said all the spells. He's the only thing keeping those entities in check. That'll trigger the staff automatically. Then I know it'll be done properly. Now, there probably is a little part of Nathaniel's mind that does think, yes, properly by a magician. You know. Nathaniel, say hello to Kitty. How does he think he's going to say hello to Kitty? I mean, it's sheer speculation. If he dismisses Bartimaeus, where does Bartimaeus go? Does he go outside and find Kitty? Does he kind of float? Nope. He goes where? So how can he say hello to Kitty? There's only one way. Either for Kitty to create a pentacle and summon him, or for Kitty to create another quality king and go to him. Now it was upon us, mouths open, tentacles slashed down, Nathaniel finished the dismissal, I went, the staff broke, typical master, right to the end, didn't give me a chance to get a word in edgewise. Which is a pity, because at that last moment, I'd like to tell him what I thought of. Nice and ambiguous, right? Dirty, rotten son of a... Or, what did he say to Nathaniel at the end of the first book? Anybody remember? You've got a conscience, kid. You, you do have some honor in you. Don't let them kill it. Second book, we do see it too. I mean, it's almost stamped out. Third book starts to rise again early on when Nathaniel is fed up with everything to do with the council, the government, you know, and he starts thinking about Kitty. And once he learns Kitty is still alive and that Kitty saved his life, that's when his transformation begins. All right? Um... Which is a pity, because at that last moment, excuse me, I'd have liked to have told him what I thought of him. Mind you, since in that split second we were, to all intents and purposes, one and the same, I rather think he meant it anyway. Meaning, Nathaniel died, how? Peacefully. He died. The way, you know, he early on sought to live, you know. Why does he go after, in the first book, <coughs> why does he go after Loveless in, let's say, the second half of the book? I mean, the first half, it's all about revenge, right? You know, you beat me senseless, I'm going to, you know, make you pay for that. The second half, it's what? Okay, you might say it's partially revenge. It's also what, though? Martha, I get that. I mean, it's for her, okay? Okay, done with that one. Sabrio. Um, any comments you want to make first about the Bartimaeus trilogy? Anybody? If there's, if there's not, that's fine. Don't feel... The then the Prudane series, 
What do you mean by your in-depth? I mean, it was, it was more like a spectrum stuff to like the conspiracy oh. stuff. Yeah. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is like it's just a different kind of like history. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it. They're both fantasy, but this is a different. This is a different kind of fantasy, and it's also, I think I'm, I may be wrong about this. I think it's aimed at a slightly different audience than the Predain series. The Predain series, to me at least. Seems to be aimed at a slightly younger audience than this is. Um, I mean, this is m often marketed not as fantasy. Sometimes it's marketed as, and I'm trying to see if it has anywhere on there, um, children's literature. A lot of books they'll have on there somewhere. It'll say something like children's lit. Um, this I don't think is. The, the humor in this would not be gotten by a 14 or 15 year old. Okay. Um, which I think is kind of what the um, Predane series is more aimed for. This is aimed more for older teen on on up. This too, okay. This is going to be totally different than this. And and one of the differences between really these um, the Bartimaeus series and the Ab Horson series or the Predane series is. This one is also filled with what? I mean, we talked about it kind of related to the footnote. It's humorous. But at the same time as you have that humor, you, you've got these kind of subtle ideas that are kind of jammed in there. And Strong's written another series called the Lockwood, the Lockwood series. And there is, I don't remember, there's six books, I think, in that. <coughs> They're very interesting. Because they deal with the problem of ghosts. Right? It's London. It's kind of our London. But there's all these ghosts around. And the people who can see the ghosts are children. Primarily up to about 15, 16, 17. Some children as old as 18. Adults can't see them. But adults are the ones who primarily suffer from the effects of the ghosts. The ghosts touch you and you die kind of a thing. Okay? And he goes through this whole long, drawn-out process of how the ghosts came to be in London and Great Britain, and we find out, you know, they're in other parts of the world, too. And he raises some really interesting ideas, but he doesn't really go anywhere with it. And I'm not sure why, right? Um, you know, Alexander... It seems like when he does bring up an idea, he fleshes it out. Now, he does it in somewhat simplistic terms. You know, the idea of heroism. We, we hear it introduced in book one. It's talked about in all five books. And he gives us, you know, kind of his definition through Karen's mouth at the end of book five. It's thinking or doing more for others than for yourself kind of a thing. Well, beginning of book one, for Karen, it's all about me. I want to be a hero and more than stuff, right? There's not a lot of heroism in here, right? Until you get to the third book. Yes? Uh, this, this, this seems more like a, like a power struggle between all the different groups. This one? Mm -hmm. Yes. This, this, you know, this is all about power. The Perdane series is not as much about Power, I mean, it is more of the growing up thing, and it's also a lot more of the kind of what makes a person a good person. You know, we see Eladir. Eladir is all about power, the power of his name, for example, the power of titles, and the power of getting the black cauldron. And he finally realizes, you know, what is good and right, and, you know, true power, you know, when he sacrifices himself for the good of others. Well, that's what John, a.k.a. Nathaniel, does in here. He thinks it's all about controlling demons. He finds his final power, you know, in his final sacrifice. Those are going to be ideas in here, too. One thing you don't see a lot of in the Perdane series is an emphasis on death. You do start to see 
that in here, okay, these books, these books are all about death. I mean, entirely about death. And what makes a good death kind of a thing. For example, let's, let's start. Um, I want to try and get us through to about page 163 today. I um, don't know that we'll get that far enough. So let's start with the prologue. <coughs> so they're three miles from the wall into the old kingdom, but that's enough. Okay. <coughs> Noonday sunshine could be seen on the other side of the wall in Anchelstein here, and not a cloud in sight. So stop for a moment, look at the map at the beginning of the book, so here's Anchelstier, here's the Old Kingdom, here's the wall. They're three miles north of the wall. But they're on an elevation high enough where they can look into Anchelstier. Right? So we're told. Um, over there in Anchelstier, you can see the noonday sunshine not a cloud in sight. Here, there is a clouded sunset. So, in Anchelstier, it's noonday. Here, in the Old Kingdom, it's sunset. Time is different, depending on which side of the wall you're on. Okay? Midwife, sh you know, shrugs her cloak up higher against her neck. Bent over the woman again, raindrops spilling from her nose. So it's raining here. It's sunny over there. And we see the woman who had staggered into their forest camp was now dead. The baby has been placed beside her. And one of the watchers says, the child too, that is, is the child dead also? Then there shall be no need for baptism. And we immediately we get introduced to this idea of baptism. Which when you first read that, if you're familiar at all with you know, Christian tradition, baptism is what? It's being dunked with water, or water sprinkled on. Words said, <coughs> it's an initiation rite. Okay? About death to what? You're baptized into death and brought out into life. It's a transformed life. So it's all about transformation, essentially. All right. And he brushes this mark on his forehead. Another hand come another man comes in, looks at them, and says, top of page three, I'm called Abhorson. We have no idea what that means. We're never told in all three books or all five books. There's another book coming out next Tuesday. I'll have it delivered then. Um, and maybe it's discussed then. I don't think it will be. We're never told what the word abhorson actually means. It's just a title, a name. Okay? He says, and there will be a baptism tonight. The charter mage, we have no idea what that is. Mage implies what? Magis, magic, okay? So this is a person who performs some kind of magic. You get charter before it, so it implies somebody who performs charter magic. We don't know what that is. Uh, child's dead. We're travelers, our life lived under the sky. It is often harsh. That is, death is part of life, buddy. We're used to death. We know death. You know, our society doesn't like to talk about death. I mean, that's why we get all the COVID numbers, or we were, you know, we're not, we're not hearing about them as much now as we did. More people died in 2021 than died in 2020 of COVID, okay? But our society likes to push death off to the side, okay? We know death, not as I do. And I say the child is not dead. Well, what does he mean? Not as I do. We don't know yet. We'll find out pretty, pretty soon, within the first 50 pages. The man tried to meet Abhorson's gaze, but faltered and looked away at his fellows. 
The woman says, so it is easily done. Sign the child, Arno. That is, put some kind of sign on the child. We'll make a new camp at Lavi's Ford. Join us when you're finished here. So we're going to leave. <laughs> you stay behind. You do the baptism thing. The charter managed and Clyde has had an ascent. The others drift away to pack up. All right. The guy doesn't want to get too close to this app person. Person, why? Bottom of three. For his name was one of secrets and unspoken fears. In other words, I've heard of app person before. And you're kind of, you know, one to stay away from. So the midwife goes to put the child down, and that person says, ah, stop, you're going to be needed. She looks down on the baby, saw it's a girl. Could be merely sleepy. She had heard of that person, and if the girl could live, she looks up at him. If the charter does not, says the man, that's the, ab that's the charter mage. If the charter does not, an ab person stops him. Let's see what the charter wills. So that implies whatever this charter is, it's sentient. It has consciousness. It has desires. <clears throat> so he looks at the child again. He takes out a bottle of something from his pouch, holds it up, you know, kind of like this, chants some words, one that listed all things, a charter that listed all things that lived or grew or once lived or would live again. And the bond that held them all together. And the bottle starts to light up from the inside. Pulsing with the rhythm of the chant. Then the chanter was silent. He touches the bottle to the earth. Then to the sign of wood ash on his forehead. And then upended it over the child. Okay. Wood ash on his forehead. There's a Tuesday in February that is called what? You're nodding your head. Yeah. Um, sorry, Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. Okay. It's the beginning of Lent in the Catholic tradition. And it, you put ashes on your forehead in the sign of the cross to show what? The beginning of your penitential journey. And the journey is from then to Easter. Okay? And he says, by the charter that binds all things, we name thee. Normally, the parents of the child would then speak the name, but Abhorson speaks. Sabriel. And as he uttered the word, the wood ash disappeared from, oh, now we're told the charter mage is a priest from the priest's forehead. Why? Because he touched the bottle to his forehead. Now he dumps the water out and we see whatever the sign is, okay, it appears on the child's head. The charter had accepted the baptism. But, but she's dead. In other words, that's not supposed to happen. How could that have happened? She's dead. Kind of implying this whole thing, it's symbolic. It's not real. It's not real dying and coming back to life. Midwife is staring across the fire at Apporson. He's staring at nothing. Slowly, a chill mist begins to rise from his body, spreading towards the man and midwife, who, notice, get on the other side of the fire. He could hear the child crying, which was good. She had gone beyond the first gateway. He could not bring her back without more stringent preparations. The current was strong, so we're being told he is in some kind of moving water. He pauses, listens. The first gate was a veil of mist. Single dark opening. The horse goes through them. The baby had not yet passed through. Okay. Standing there, looming out of the black waters, was a shadow darker than the gate, several feet higher than that person, and there's marsh lights, whatever those are, around it. He advances on the thing, the baby's asleep, held in the crook of this thing's arm, okay, 
Abhorson brings out a small silver handbell. And whatever this thing is holding it, it says, page 7, Spirit of your spirit, Abhorson, you can't spell me while I hold you. Perhaps I shall take her beyond the gate, as her mother has already done. Abhorson says, you have a new shape, Caracor. You are now this side of the first gate. Who was foolish enough to assist you? Notice, we don't know who Caragor is. We don't know what the first gate is. We don't know what the hell is going on. One of the usual, but unskilled, he didn't realize it would be in the nature of an exchange. That is, he didn't realize that in calling me forward, he had to go. Kind of a life for life mentality. His life was not sufficient for me to pass the last portal. But now you're here. Implication, your life is sufficient. I who change you beyond the seventh gate. Okay, so now we're, we know there's more than one of these gates. So there is at least one through seven. And we're told this Caragor being has been bound here, but now... He's been moved up to before the first gate. Hmm. Yes. But if you want the child, and he makes as if to throw the baby into the stream, okay, she lands, squalling, instantly caught up in the flow of the river, but Ab Horse and lunges forward, snatches her from both the river and Caragor's grasping hands. He steps back, he draws the silver bell, he swings it so it sounds twice, Caragor says some words, page 9, the baby wails a scant second before Abhorson opened his eyes so that the midwife was already halfway around the fire, that is she's going back around the fire now beside Abhorson, where the baby is lying. Frost crackled on the ground, icicles hung from Abhorson's nose, and he asked, how's the baby? As you hear, Lord, she is very well, a little cold. Okay. So, the midwife, you're, you're a necromancer? What's necromancy? Necro, death. Mancy, magic. That's what it's related to. Okay. So in the Harry Potter novels, you have arithmancy, which is just chilling for me. Numbers, math, magic. Okay. Necromancy is magic to bring the dead back to life. He says, mm, kind of. I loved the woman who lies here. She would have lived if she had loved another. <laughs> she wouldn't have died if it hadn't been for me. But she did not. Sabriel is our child. Can you not see the kinship? She says, yes, I'll come with you and I'll look after Sabriel. But you're going to need a letter, she says, you know, and a lot else. The charter maid says, if you seek a man who knows a little of the charter, I should wish to serve, for I have seen its working, my lord, though I am loath to leave my fellow wanderers. Perhaps you will not have to. I wonder if your leader will object to two new members joining her band. For my work means I must travel, and there is no part of the kingdom that has not felt the imprint of my feet. That is, north, south, east, and west, I traveled all over the old kingdom. Your work? It's like, uh, what do you do? I am a necromancer, but not of the common kind. Where others of the art, that is necromancy, raise the dead, I lay them back to rest. I lay, okay, who's the them? The dead. I put the dead back into death, okay? Because when he talks about I'm a necromancer, not of the common kind, while others of the art raise the dead, He's not talking like, you know, the biblical story of Lazarus. They don't come back alive and living really in this world. They are what in the popular parlance? Zombies. They're the undead. They're the living dead, the walking dead. And those that will not resist, I bind or try to. I am Abhorson. 
And what that kind of means is that's what amp horses do. Doesn't tell us what amp horses means. You know, it just means it's what we do. We send the dead back to death. But notice what else it means, seemingly at least. Because what can he do? He can take those who have seemingly, let's say, died, or let's go all Princess Bride, who are mostly dead, have left this world, and God knows. We have this world, and there's death, and they've gone to this world. Okay? But what has he told us about this place? Well, there are at least seven days. Actually, there's going to be nine days. And in order to be really, truly, fully dead, not mostly dead, you got to go past the ninth day. Okay? When you go past gate number nine, you can't be called back. You can't be called back if you get past gate number eight. It ain't going to be pretty, though. The farther and farther you go into death, the more and more decrepit you're going to look when you come back. Okay? That's one of the basic ideas that we're going to see. So, chapter one. What do we do? We meet in, uh, Sabriel and one of her friends and, you know, her school teacher and such. Her friend, Jason, Jason, however you pronounce her name. Had a bunny that died, her little pet, and Sabriel brought it back to life. We're told, page 16, before the little triangle thing. Death and what came after death was no great mystery to Sabriel. She just... <coughs> Sorry. She just wished it was. She wished she didn't know didn't know what she knows about death, okay? So, it's her last term at Wiverly, Wiverly, however you pronounce it, this, you know, boarding school she's at, okay? And we find out the kinds of classes she's in, page 16. She's graduated already, coming first in English, equal first in music, third in mathematics, seventh in science, second in fighting arts, fourth in etiquette, so that gives us a little bit of understanding about her, right? So she's really good with words, right? She's really good with music. Yeah, math she's not so great at. Even worse in science. I mean, that she just sucks there. Fighting arts, pretty good. And etiquette, you know, she's not all that polished manners wise, right? Magic only worked in those regions of Anchelsteer close to the wall. So She's in Anchelsteer, the southern half on that map. Well, I take it, but not even half, like the southern fourth of that map. All right? The farther and farther away you get from the old wall, that is, the farther and farther away you get from the old kingdom, less and less magic works. Translate that to our world, and what does that kind of apply? We're about as far away from the old kingdom as you can get. Okay? Well, I am. I don't know. Maybe you guys go off and read it. <clears throat> so, it teaches magic, the school she does, she's at, teaches magic to those students who could obtain special permission from their parents. Notice, not everybody there learns magic. Okay? Her father comes every now and then. She doesn't see him that often. But he does send, we're told, page 18, every now and then, Abhorson's ascending of himself always appeared at the dark of the moon. What does that mean? His sending of himself. Does he like get a giant mailer and put a stamp on it? It's unclear. Okay. But suddenly she's not feeling well. She feels uneasy about something. We're told on page nine, uh, excuse me, 19. Okay. She goes into the dormitory in page 21, we're told. There's 40 girls in the dorm, most of the first form, all under the age of 11. 
Very, very similar to Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter, you know, begins his adventures when he turns 11. First years are 11 years old. Most of these girls were told, or all of these girls, are under the age of 11. Why? Garth Nix is Australian. The Australian educational system is very similar to the British educational system in terms of the boarding school. And you start at about the age of 10 or so. And you go through the age of 17 to 18. Some start a little younger, some start a little later. Okay? So Sabriel goes into the dormitory, fingers crooked in a spell casting stand. Even before she looked, there's death in there somewhere. It's not like she goes, oh man, something's dead in there. No. She knows the dormitory is locked, but locks don't stop. Death. An intensely dark shape stood there as if someone had cut a man-shaped figure out of the night. Now think about that for a moment. It's dark in the room, but there's a man-shaped darker darkness back there. What about, you know, this is uh, an African-American friend of mine once said, you know, if you watch horror movies, and who inevitably, you know, Gets killed first. There's a bunch of kids. They're at a campground. A bunch of college students are spending the night at a cabin with the lake and stuff. And her comment was always, stupid white people. Because blacks would never do that. They would never go off where they know, you know, somebody died, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Stupid white girl kind of thing. There's death. She goes towards it. All right? So she makes this gesture. Conjure some magic. And page 23. It was an old kingdom denizen. That is, something that lives there. It doesn't belong here. Vaguely humanoid. More like an ape. Semi-intelligent. More than that, she could feel this thing had a thread. You know, kind of metaphorically tied to it. That goes back beyond the first day. So this thing's been sent from death. Or from mostly death. As long as the threat existed, the creature would be totally under the control of its master. And the school's magistrix, okay, which is an interesting word, because it can mean one who practices magic, or it can be the feminine form of the word magister, master, the headmistress. Very nice how he does that, okay? Is right beside Sabriel suddenly. And she says, it's a dead spirit, a dead form, sorry, a dead servant, a spirit form. Without free will, something is controlling it. It's not malign, Sabriel says, nor is it attempted any action harm. And she says, don't do anything. I'm going to try to speak to it. Okay. How old is Sabriel? She's 18. How old can we assume uh, Ms. Greenwood is? I'm older than 18. 30? 40 maybe? She's older. She's more experienced. Okay. Because of being headmistress near, you know, the old kingdom inside. And here you have this 18-year-old saying, shh, let me talk to it. Why does the teacher go, no, no, you shh, let me talk to it. Well, who's Samuel's father? Abworth. So she whistles, whistles several notes, the thing flinches, and it drops a sack. And finally, it speaks. Sabriel, bottom of 25, my messenger, take the sack, the voice was Abworth. Her father. So her father sent this. Wait. But it was sent from death. If her father sent it, and it was sent from death, logically, her father must be beyond this, at least. Page 26. The sack her hand was heavy. There was a leaden feeling in her stomach. Why? She knows what's there. <coughs> If the messenger was truly Abhorson's, then he himself was unable to return to the realm of the living. 
And that meant he's either dead or trapped by something that should have passed beyond the final gate. Something within one through eight is trapped again. Okay. Ms. Green would ask, top of 27, what did you do? It had a message on it, so I took it. She opens the sack, she reaches inside, a sword hilt, met her grasp, she draws it out, puts it to one side. She doesn't need to look at it. <laughs> she knows what it is. It was Adhorse's sword. Then she pulls out a leather bandolier. I don't know if your cover has, mine's different than all of yours, if it shows the bandolier, but you know, in mine, it's got all of the little bells. Okay. Seven tubular leather pouches hung from it, starting with one the size of a small pill bottle, growing larger, till the seventh was almost the size of a jar. It's to be worn across the chest, okay? And she says, Father's instruments, tools of the necromancy. Why is he sending me these? <clears throat> the magistrates. But there are charter ones on the bell and the handle. Necromancy is free magic not governed by the charter. So now we get introduced to, okay, we've heard about the charter, but now we're told there's free magic. So the charter seems to be ordered to control magic. Free magic may just mean, you know, magic that's kind of floating all around and you can tap into it, so to speak. Sabriel, fathers was different. Binding, not raising. He was a faithful servant of the charter. You're going to be leaving us, aren't you? She doesn't make that as a declarative statement. You are leaving us. Like, you're not bringing that dangerous stuff into here. She's saying, oh, you've got to go, don't you? Something has happened. I just saw it in the reflection of the bell. You were crossing the wall. Clairvoyant? <laughs> yes, into the old kingdom. Something has happened to Father, but I'll find it. So I swear by the charter I bear. The charter she bears, that's the mark. Whatever, I, I'm sorry, I accidentally, I always put the sign of the cross. It does turn out that is the mark that they put on the forehead. It's a cross, all right? We're going to see it tellingly at the end of the novel, too, where she's going to have a big kind of cross-like image on her body. Okay. But he doesn't ever do anything with that kind of symbolism. He uses it, Nick uses it all throughout. Okay. So, the magistrate says, I'll go explain to the girls, page 29. Behind these plans, her thoughts kept jumping back to Abhorst. What could have happened to trap him in death? And what could she really hope to do about it? Why does she think? What could she hope to do about it? If he couldn't stop it from happening, what's an 18 year old girl who's barely experienced it going to do? Okay? So she makes herself, excuse me, she makes her way to the wall. And the walls, the, the weather is clear and cool on this side of the wall, but it's snow and snowing on the other side of the wall, right? Um, let's see here. She sees soldiers carrying spears and such. She goes up to one, page 37, says, I'm a citizen of the old kingdom. He demands papers. She gives him a frosty smile. She makes a ritual movement with the tips of her fingers. You know, just, you know, kind of like Obi-Wan. These are not the droids you seek. As her fingers sketch, she forms a symbol in her mind. Okay. And her papers, her blank papers, turn into an angel steer passport, etc., etc. Okay. But as she starts to make another charter mark, draws the attention of other soldiers. Page 39. They come out, rifles drawn, swords, you know, bayonets, etc. And a, another man shouts, stop. 
to the corporal who's moving close to her. In his face, Sabriel suddenly realized that it meant to use, excuse me, bottom of 39. In his face, that is, in the corporal's face, Sabriel suddenly realized what it meant to use magic on the perimeter. She held herself absolutely still, blanking out the partly made signs in her mind. In other words, she realizes how dangerous it is to use magic here so close to the old king. Her ski slipped further down her arm, the bindings catching for a moment before falling to the ground. Soldiers rush forward, and they form a ring around her, swords pointed towards her throat. And she sees on the swords crudely written charter symbols. These weapons were made to kill things that were already dead. They think she's a dead thing. Right? The man in charge is an officer. He comes to her. He picks up her passports off the ground because they've been dropped by the corporal. His eyes were pale blue, held a mixture of harshness and compassion that she finds familiar. He closes the passport, stick, sticks it in his belt. He reveals his charter mark which is a means of kind of saying, I'm like you. I understand the magic. She lifts her hand, reaches out with two fingers, and touches that charter mark. As she did so, he reached forward and touched hers. Sabriel felt the familiar swirl of energy, the feeling of falling into some endless galaxy of stars. Right? And he says, an unsullied charter mark. Unsullied. Undirtied, right? In other words, you're not some dark thing. You're not something from death. She is no creature or sending. Right? So he says, You're the daughter of Avorson. I'm Colonel Horace. He says, I've got a charter mark. I know some small knowledge of magic. They chit-chat for a bit. He says, I remember when Ab Horson would come to meet you. His voice falters a little. And she asked, um, did you know my father? Because notice, she notices that as they're speaking, his eyes glance towards her waist. He's not checking her out because anything sexual. He sees the sword. He recognizes the scabbard. He sees the bandolier of bells. Who used to wear those? Abhorsa. Did, did, dot, 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 do you know my father? Did implies he can't anymore because he's dead. He used to visit me twice a year. I guess he would have come. Yes, I saw him. I first met him more than 20 years ago. He says when I was posted here at the subaltern, it's like a private. Strange time. Very bad time. And he goes on and explains. Says, I know you're a necromancer. You'll probably understand. And he talks about what her father did. There used to be dead rising a lot. And her father created these massive wind charms that protect everything on this side of the wall. Corpses wouldn't stay buried, he says, page 44. Or old, our people, or old king. Creatures kept coming over. He says on one patrol, page 45, we met a man sitting by a charter stone on top of a hill that overlooked both the wall and the perimeter. It was Abhorson. He was coming to us because he'd heard about the dead. So he says, we escorted him in. Right? He talks about the wind flutes. He says, I'm glad you understand, page 46. I still don't. They don't make any sound. They've got charter symbols on them, and when he starts placing them, one night they're dead, 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 dead. Right? He says, so whatever it was, it worked, and we are deeply indebted to you, Clem. Fabriel, I may be less honored and more reviled as a messenger of ill omen. I'm going to look for my father. Something has happened. He's like, nah, shoot. She tells him he's trapped in death. His bindings will be broken. 
the wind flute. All the dead hear, the flutes play a song only heard in death. So, he's dead, possibly, she says. The bound, the dead, are tied to him. The flutes will have no power if, they will have no power if Aphorson is no longer dead. They will bind him no more. That is, if he's really dead, if he's truly dead, then at some point soon, the dead are going to rise up right here. Right? And he says, it's not your fault. Um, how long? Page 50. How long till the dead are free? She says it depends, 51. If he's truly dead, the wind flutes will simply fall apart under the light of the next full moon. He says, uh, next full moon, two weeks, 14 days. She says, possible I could bind the dead again. That is, it's possible, if he is dead, I can rebind him. Haven't done it, you know, but... If Father isn't beyond the ninth gate, I need to help him as soon as I can. If he's not gone beyond this one, what does she mean I need to help him? Yeah, she thinks I can bring him back. <coughs> and before I can do that, I gotta get to his house. I've gotta I've gotta gather some things. I gotta check some references, you know. I've gotta go to the library and read some books. It's like I've gotta do surgery and I don't know how. Because hmm. what has she brought back from the dead? A rabbit. Okay. What has she bound into death? Nothing. So, he shows her a map of the old kingdom called Cloven Crest. It's a charter stone. He says it was struck by lightning. Well, it's been broken into two as if struck by lightning a month or so ago. And he says, farther in, I can't really tell you. you know, our maps don't really say. Page 56. Horace tells her, I've got a daughter about your age. Back in Corvera, town farther away from the wall. I would not let her cross into the old kingdom. Sabriel looks at him and notice we're told her eyes were not the uncertain flickering beacons of adolescence. She's not a flighty, air-headed girl. She says, I'm only 18 years old on the outside. That is what you, what you see. I first walked into death when I was 12. So what does it mean? I'm only 18 on the outside. I walked into death when I was 12. I've, I've experienced a bit. I encountered a fifth gate wrestler when I was 14, banished it beyond the ninth gate. Okay. Notice she hasn't bound something that was here into, but in death, she's bound things beyond the ninth gate. When I was 16, I stalked, oh, correction. I stalked and banished a mordecai that came near the school. Now, a Mordecant is a powerful, dead creature. A weakened Mordecant, okay, so, it, you know, it's like Monty Python, you know, Black Knight, with both arms and legs chopped off, so it's the one-legged Mordecant, but still. I turned the final page of the Book of the Dead. I don't feel young anymore. Okay. A year ago, I turned, that is, I've read the Book of the Dead. And when she says read, it doesn't mean, you know, oh, look, I finished several. It means I understand it. We kind of, you know, we talked about experience and wisdom and all that kind of stuff. A, a lot of literature, all old English literature, you know, essentially says you can't be wise until you, until you have experienced many shares of winters in this world. Meaning you got to be old and gray before you can get to be wise. She's saying, I feel old and gray, but she's only 18. Compare the difference between some, you know, kid who's raised in a house, an affluent house, you know, and everything goes well, versus some kid raised in the inner city. You know, 
The kid in the inner, raised in the inner city has a lot more of what's called what? Street smarts, usually, than the other ones. Why? He had to deal with a hell of a lot more. Right? In one sense. The kid in the affluent house might have to deal with a hell of a lot more of other kinds of problems. Right? Horace says, I'm sorry for that. Why? Because 18-year-olds shouldn't have to deal with that kind of stuff. It's like, uh, should I go there? Yeah, I should. It, it's like teaching kindergartners about ginger fluidity. No. No, you should. No. Let them be who they are. Period. I mean, he says, I wish you some of the foolish joys my daughter has. Some of the lightness, the lack of responsibility that goes with you. With you. But I don't wish it. I don't want you to be, you know, the airhead if it will weaken you in the times ahead. Right? If that lack of responsibility, if that lack of clear thinking is going to make you weak in the coming weeks, days, months, no, I don't. I want you to be cold and hard as steel. <clears throat> you have chosen a difficult path. Did she? Did she choose this path? Did Nathaniel choose his path? No. Did Karen choose his path? Yeah, not really. It's, you know, he starts off in Dalbin's care, you know. Sabriel asks. So notice all three sets of books, all three novelists kind of raise this question. Does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? What does it really mean to have free will? Those words were the dedication in the front of our almanac. They're also the very last words of the Book of the Dead. I've heard that. What does that mean? Horace asks. I don't know. It holds power when you say it. Does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? In the Lord of the Rings, in the Lord of the Rings, in second novel, second installment, the uh, two towers, Grotto and Sam are with Gollum, and they're making their way to Mordor, and they get to the path, the path that's called the passage of the marshes, the dead marshes, and the path of the, um, not the path of the dead. And Frodo asks Gollum, how do we shape our path? Notice, how do we shape it? How do we get through these marshes? Because, you know, if you're in swampy land, if you step off a firm piece of ground into the marshy ground, you can drown, okay? So he's saying, how do we make our way through? Later in the novel, <coughs> Frodo talks about this is how our path is laid. I no longer have any free choice. I've, I've got to follow the path that is laid out for me. Turns out to be both. Because <laughs> he can do what? He can stop at any point, at any moment. Okay? He says, if I spoke those words, they'd just be words. She says, I don't know. I can't explain them. I know other sayings that are more to the point. Like, traveler, embrace the morning light. Or, one from Owl World, strike while the iron's hot. It's a heaven to smith forging metaphor. Strike while the iron is hot is, you have that iron on the anvil, you strike it when it's still red hot. Because once it loses its heat, you're not going to shape it anymore. All right? So, he sends her on her way. She goes up to the wall, and there's these marks on the wall, and they all start to move. And Horace says, the old kingdom welcomes you. Chapter 4. 
She finds an ancient spear and soldier about six miles from the wall. Okay. He'd been dead 12 days. So she releases him. She binds him, so to speak, to the dead. She takes his sword. She thrusts it through the melted snow, page 65. It stuck fast, upright. The hilt casting a shadow like a cross upon the ashes. Notice, she torched his body, which is doing what, obviously? What's, what is that going to produce? Light? Smoke? It's like, hello, I'm here. No. So the hilt casts a shadow like a cross on his ashes. And then she sees the identity, identity disc or tag. Right? She keeps going on somewhere up ahead. She feels more death. She gets up to the charter stone, now called Cloven Crest. She finds a bunch of dead. What's different between these and the Angel Steer and soldiers she just found? These bodies have all been decapitated now. And the heads taken. Why? Because that leaves their souls in control of somebody else. Without their heads, page 70, she can only bring them back as hands, a derogatory term that free magic necromancers use for their lackluster revenants who retain little of their original intelligence and none of their initiative. They made useful servants, in other words, like zombies. Okay. So she sees some charter marks. She realizes one of the dead was a charter mage. She kind of does some magic, and this voice comes out. Page 72. One of the greater dead. It came behind us, almost from the wall. We couldn't turn back. It has servants, hands, a mordecai. One of the greater dead, she thinks, 73. We'll stop here. One of the greater dead was back in life, and that was something her father was sworn to stop. They got to be connected. Her father's missing in the greater dead back to life. Okay, so we will pick up. We'll pick up on Tuesday with chapter five. We're going to get up through. All right. Uh, we got Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to get. Yeah, I think we're going to try and get through chapter 15 on Tuesday. So up through page 250. No, take that back. Up through page 339. Yeah, that's one third. That's one third. That's, yeah, we're going to try to get up through page 339 on Tuesday. Okay, stop there. Um, I've got the quiz up for 